This is Chapter 24, The West Between Wars. All right, so here's an overview of Chapter 24, what happened between World War I and World War II. There is an age of prosperity, the 20s, followed by financial depression, the 30s. This low economic place led to the rise of totalitarian leaders, people who needed something to believe in, believed in these leaders. The leaders required only passive obedience from their subjects. And you can see in the picture below the rise of the totalitarian states. In Italy, it was Mussolini. In Russia, it was Stalin. And in Germany, it was Hitler. Now, when we're looking at section one here, you can see the feudal search for stability. There are four sections, the weak League of Nations. As you remember, at the end of World War II, that was what tried to keep everybody together from getting into another world war. The French demands, inflation in Germany, and the Treaty of Locarno. Now, the League of Nations was the intergovernmental organization founded as a result of the P Paris Peace Conference that ended the First World War. It was the first international organization whose principal mission was to maintain world peace. Needless to say, it didn't work. The U.S. never joined making uh, the League work, and nations could not approve using force against aggression. The French demands, well, the French wanted Germany to pay their debt from World War I, which was, look at that, 33 billion dollars. By 1922, Germany said that they could not pay, so France sent troops into the Ruhr Valley, Germany's um, industrial area, to collect the money by using mines, uh, using mines and factories. So obviously they were using force to get their money back from all the damage that was caused on France during the First World War. But if there's no money to pay you, then what that does is that further forces Germany into a mental state of retaliation. Even though they may have caused this, this still makes them want to retaliate. So because of all of this debt, Germany has inflation. The German workers went on strike and refused to um, work for the French because they didn't want to pay the French debt. Uh, Germany printed more money, causing the prices to go up, and you cannot simply print more money. It has to be backed by gold. So just simply printing more money doesn't actually give you more wealth. Um, in 1914, 4.5 German mark equaled $1. Um, by November 1st of 23, it was 130 billion marks equaled $1. So it was useless money. It was useless paper. You might as well use it for toilet paper. So as the inflation rises, every dollar you own buys a smaller percentage of goods and services, as you can see down below. So printed money was worthless based upon this inflation. And the Treaty of Lucarno, written by France and Germany, it guaranteed Germany's new western borders with France and Belgium. And it did seem to encourage France, or it did seem to encourage peace. This is actually a question just as the inflation was. Germany joined the League of Nations weak because it just promised um, and did not have the enforcement to back it up. That's the League of Nations. It just didn't have the power to back anything up. So now what we're looking at is this area of um, the Great Depression, which you guys will look at a little more closely in world uh, when you're in U.S. history. So there's causes. The prices on farm goods dropped. And in 1929, the U.S. stock market crashed because the U.S. withdrew funds from Germany. And the responses from all of this is that 40% of Germans were out of work. Governments did not know how to handle this. Governments became very involved in economic affairs, increasing Marxist ideas. So when the government gets involved in your um, ways of making money, then it encourages communism or Marxism. People followed political leaders that wanted to solve this problem, and Hitler seemed to be perfect for that. Now, if you look at this, again, we're still in Section 1, and you can see it's a rather big section for Germany, France, Great Britain, and the, U, uh, the United States. The democratic states after the war, well, Wilhelm II led to the Weimar Republic, had uh, many problems of inflation, no real leader other than Hindenburg. And you can see a Hindenburg, the Hindenburg is a Zeppelin, excuse me, that Zeppelin is named after Hindenburg in France um, became the strongest European power. In the 1930s, it brought political chaos. People that were politically left or communist and socialists from the popular front government. They uh, started collective bargaining, the right of unions to negotiate with employers to get a 40-hour work week and two hours of paid vacation. In Great Britain, they lost much of its industry to the U.S. and Japan. Remember, it, during the Industrial Revolution, pretty much started in Great Britain. Uh, so if they were losing this, this was a huge change to their entire economic um, back. 
the Labour Party lost control to the Conservatives. They brought Great Britain out of the Depression. John Keyes felt the government should spend their way out of the Depression. And so you can see where it says, I started um, programs that built Hoover Dam. I am Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he is a U.S. president, most um, elected president of all time. Because after him, they actually put a cap in the amendments to say that a um, president could not be in power um, more than 10 years or two political elections. After Germany, uh, the U.S. was the worst hit by the Depression. 12 million people were unemployed. President FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, created the New Deal, where the government became more involved in putting people back to work. The, de the New Deal did not solve unemployment. World War II tends to add a little bit more to unemployment because what it is is it puts people back into jobs in factories and stuff like that. So now we're on to section two. And what you have is a map of uh, Europe and you have some of these leaders so you can identify them. Joseph Stalin is the leader of the USSR. Believe it or not, he actually killed more people in concentration camps than um, Hitler did. Only because he lived longer than Hitler. Um, take advantage of grabbing power from Leon Trotsky and um, Lenin. So he took over. Hitler joined the Workers' Party, the right-wing extreme nationalism. By 1921, he was in control and named the party uh, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, Nazis. Benito Mussolini established the first European fascist movement in Italy. Fascism glorifies the state above all individuals with a strong central government. He formed bands of black shirts to attack socialist um, socialists. This gave him support from landowners. And finally down there, down there is Francisco Franco of Spain. He led forces against the Spanish government. Italy and Germany sent forces to help him. Uh, troops, and what really ended up happening were the Italians and the Germans used this time in Spain to practice warfare, to get their weaponry ready and everything else for World War II. So Spain was this practice um, pregame or uh, before they actually started the next World War. So the next um, section, we have here section three, of course, is the rise of Hitler in the German, Nazi Germany. There to the right, you can see Mein Kampf. And Mein Kampf really preached nationalism and being proud of one's own nation and how, you know, everybody that is German is good and above all else and those types of things. Once he's out of prison, he expanded the Nazi uh, party in Germany. As democracy broke down, right-wing elites looked to Hitler for leadership. Okay, so once he takes power, this is the third, of course, in Germany. And so what we have here is um, Hitler and his views, the rise of Nazis, victory of Nazism, and the Nazi state. Hitler was born in Austria, and he failed secondary school. He wanted to be an artist, served four years in the Western Front during World War I. Um, it is said that he was almost killed by a British soldier, but the British soldier actually let him go free. And imagine how many people might have survived had that person killed him on the battlefields during World War I. In 1919, he joined the German Workers' Party, is very right-wing. In 1921, he controlled the party. By, the 20, by 1923, he staged an armed uprising called the uh, Beer Hall Putsch. Um, he was sentenced to prison. In prison, he wrote Mein Kampf, uh, which is My Struggle, a book about German nationalism linked to social Darwinism. And remember social Darwinism where people think that other people rise to the top just as you see in the animal world where animals will pick on the weaker ones and destroy them. So Hitler does take that to heart um, and, of course, uh, starts to annihilate different races of people based upon his views with social Darwinism. The Nazis would need to gain power legally. That's what he figured out. He can't do this illegally anymore. So by 1929, Nazis were the National Party, like the Democrats or the Republicans, in Parliament, the Reichstag. Uh, Hitler promised a new Germany with jobs, showing national pride. See, I mean, they want to work. People want to work. And the more people that are out of work, the, the more idle they become. And what do they say? Idle minds are the devil's playground. Um, in 1930, President um, was Hindenburg. Hindenburg was pressured to um, pressured to make Hitler chancellor and create a new government. By uh, March 23rd, 1933, Parliament passed an enabling act allowing four years to ignore the Constitution. This gave Hitler all the power. Concentration camps were set up for people who opposed them, and by 1933, Germany was a totalitarian state. The Nazi state was an Aryan state was to be established. The Third Reich. First Reich was the Roman Empire. Second Reich was the German Empire. 
and now terror was used on the people. The Nuremberg Laws excluded Jews from German citizenship, forbade marriages between Jews and Germans, and yellow stars you could see to the left that said Jude uh, marked um, people that were of Jewish descent. Uh, Kristallnacht, a destructive rampage against the Jews that happened. It's Crystal Night. I believe it's because of the breaking of glass that happened on that night. Now, this particular slide shows you the different people that are in power. I definitely know that this is a question that you'll be asked. This particular chapter is not covering World War II. Remember, this is the era leading up to World War II. So um, you, uh, we're going to go a little bit more into the social aspects, radio movie trends, and of course, mass leisure. Mass leisure, there is a question there. There was the establishment of the work week and work hours, a defined working society and jobs of mass production that allowed people more time off or leisure time. Time that allowed people to pursue activities not related to survival. So I don't just go out in the farm and I don't just work and I don't just grow my own food or grow my own cows to eat or anything like that. I actually can go out and enjoy my time off. Um, and some of the ways that we would enjoy that is by listening to the radio or going to movies. And so one of the most famous movie people is Charlie Chaplin there. And of course these films were typically, were silent and they were, there was usually a piano player in the audience that played the piano that went with this um, movie. And there would also be times where you would read the screen. So kind of like closed caption for the hearing impaired, but it wasn't really closed caption because it was short excerpts about the story that, um, that helped convey the message. So what you have here is one of the most famous um, artists from the time, uh, Salvador Dali, was the high priest of surrealism. He painted everyday objects but separated them from their normal context by placing recognizable objects in unrecognizable relationships. Hitler rejected modern art as degenerate and believed they could create a new German art, very nationalistic. And as you see in this next slide, um, if you look to the right, that's the different information that Hitler was referring to. Um, so he felt if you visited Munich in the summer of that year, you could see two spectacular exhibitions that were held only a few hundred meters apart. One was the German art exhibition showcasing recent leading examples of Aryan art, and the other was degenerate art. Uh, so you could see how it's advertised in those two different ways. Now, a different, um, the two modern art between wars is the Dada movement and surrealism. Dada, the word doesn't make sense, so why should art? So that's the whole idea of the Dada movement. Life has no, it should say no purpose, and Hannah Hawk is one of the most famous, and you can see Hannah Hawk's work down there. It's a photo montage, a picture made up of a combination of photographs. This is a type of Dadaism or the Dada movement. So, you guys, you have successfully made it through chapter 24. Uh, please go on and answer your questions.